Amen. What a, a beautiful song, and just uh, comes straight from the scripture, right? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For uh, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who God is, amen? That's who Jesus is, who he sent him to be. Uh, Last week, we started this uh, new series called One Thing. We're starting off this new year really just um, trying to to clear through the clutter of our life and say, what is the priority? What's the one thing that my life will be about in 2022? And last week, if you were here, we talked about uh, Mary and Martha and that famous uh, interaction between those two. We talked about how it's so easy to get distracted, even by good things, that we miss the best thing, right? And if you don't start with Jesus, the bread of life, then nothing else will ever satisfy. Now, I think, uh, if you remember in my message, I talked about priorities, then I joked a little bit about watching football, and I joked about my blessed Bengals, right? <laughs> Who day? <laughs> uh, I think God decided to test me. Because do you know what happened? I talked about priorities, making Jesus the one thing in your life. And then, out of six playoff time slots, yesterday they scheduled my beloved Bengals to potentially have their first win in the playoffs in 31 years at the only time slot that I could not watch it because I was here in church. (laughs) Okay, God, I got it, right? (laughs) What does it look like if we make Jesus the one thing in our life? Here's the question that I really want you to ponder this morning as we dig into the scripture. Very simple. How much is Jesus worth to you? How much is Jesus worth to you? I mean, really, not just in words, not just in some sort of image that you like to portray, but when you really push comes to shove, what is he worth in your life? And what does it really look like when you make Jesus the one thing in your life? I want to turn to John chapter 12. We're going to talk about Mary again, the same Mary that we talked about last week with Mary and Martha. We're going to look at another encounter with this same Mary that comes to us, beginning of John chapter 12. If you want to follow along, it'll be on the screen, and you can turn in your Bible with me if you want. John chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. Here's here's how John writes it. Six days before the Passover... Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Imagine that, right? If you were here last week. While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Uh, just a little context. The, just the chapter right before this is when that uh, resurrection of Lazarus is recorded. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And so now they're having a, a dinner uh, to celebrate. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is a story uh, that's found in different forms in every one of the four Gospels. And so obviously this is, this is an occurrence that was important to early believers. And what we find is we have Jesus here in the center of this story at dinner, 
And in an act that would have seemed beyond strange, okay, this is beyond strange for those around, Mary brings a very expensive jar of perfume called nard and pours it on his feet. In some of the other accounts in the Gospels uh, we read, in, it may have been poured upon his head as well. And then she uses her own hair to wipe his feet. This is odd, okay? This is odd in our own culture, but it would have been certainly odd in theirs as well. And this account is startling on a number of levels. First, the nard that Mary dumps on Jesus, uh, we learn it from the text, extremely valuable. Uh, it tells us right in the text from Judas's comment, it's worth a year's wages. Think about that. This is a gift of true extravagance. At that price, uh, some scholars wager that this may have been a family heirloom that had been passed down over multiple generations. And imagine what that would be like in, in our world today. I looked up just, just for kind of a frame of reference, uh, one of the nearby towns is Vandalia. The median household income in Vandalia is around $58,000. Imagine how long it would take you or just a typical person to save up that kind of sum of money or to have an object that was worth that kind of money. And then in a matter of seconds, to use it all up on someone else. Right, we read the story, read about the nard, that's great. Now, think about that in realistic terms. This is dramatic. Nard was a perfume that many times was used to anoint royalty. It would have been extremely potent. Often, it would have just been used a few drops at a time. Likely, it would have even been watered down before it was ever used. And the aroma was, would have been so intense from this much nard and that level of purity that it would probably would have been almost overwhelming for those that were in the house. In fact, in verse 3 it says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. In this act, uh, Mary likely would have just had to break uh, off basically a long slender neck that would have been at the top of this jar in order to be able to pour it all at once. On the Jesus. This is odd. This is a strange act by Mary. And there's another startling uh, component to this situation. The fact that Mary lets her hair down to wipe his feet, this is also a countercultural thing to do. It's my understanding that a girl, after reaching a certain age of womanhood, would wear her head, uh, her hair up tightly upon her head, and that this act of letting her hair down and using it to wipe his feet would have, would have been seen as a negative thing, an overly vulnerable thing, maybe even a promiscuous thing. And yet, Mary just simply pours out her love for Jesus Kind of like, it seems like just in the only way she knows how, she just, she's got to do it. She's intent to worship Jesus as generously as she can come up with. She would hold nothing back. Because in the way in which Mary has come to know him, she realizes he deserves it all. Think about the way in which this encounter uh, kind of parallels and, and is very similar to some of what we heard last week with the encounter with Mary and Martha. Where does Mary find herself? She again finds herself at the feet of Jesus. Remember the story last week? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening. And again, what happens? She's criticized for stepping out of cultural bounds in her adoration of him. In both account encounters, it's like, Mary, you're just a little bit too into Jesus. You, you just love him a little bit too much, Mary. In both cases, she risks her own reputation because she is enthralled with this rabbi. In both her acts of listening and anointing, it just doesn't make sense to the world around her. 
And yet for Mary, in both cases, it just, it just seems like this is the only response that makes sense to her. It's as if she can't, she can't help herself. She knows the truth about this Jesus, and she just can't help but put herself near him and to worship him. I said this uh, last week, and I want to say it again because we see it again in this story. If you make Jesus your one thing, if you make him the very center of your life, people will not understand you. And you will face backlash from the world around you. In fact, I'll say it uh, uh, even a little bit more strongly. If you call yourself a Christian and you never face any kind of weird response from the world around you and you never face any kind of backlash from those around you, you may want to question whether or not Jesus is actually at the center of your life. I want you to think about a comparison uh, between two of the characters, the two primary characters in this story. Uh, last week we did this, we kind of compared Mary and Martha a little bit. And this week I, I want us just to compare Mary and Judas just a little bit. The differences in their approach to Jesus, in their heart posture towards Jesus. Judas, and likely, um, just to be fair, the other disciples too, was immediately critical of Mary's action, wasn't he? Judas says, well, th that perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. But the interesting thing is we learned right in the text, he's not so much interested in helping the poor, is he? Judas was the keeper of the purse. He's the one who took care of the money for the disciples. And it says that he would often just help himself to whatever was in there. And so his, his uh, protest here is not so much about other people being helped. It's really that he's... He, he's not so happy that he's not going to get a cut of this great wealth that she's just poured out upon Jesus, right? Now, I want you to remember something. It's, it's right after this encounter, in, in the progression of events in Jesus at the end of his life, it's right after this encounter, really, not long after it, that we learn that Jesus, or that Judas, excuse me, goes and agrees to a deal with the religious leaders to hand Jesus over to them, and what does he get out of it? 30 silver coins. You see, we, we, this is Judas's MO. We know what drives him, don't we? 30 silver coins. That's an interesting, interesting figure. Do you know in Exodus chapter 21, it tells us in the Old Testament law that if uh, a, neighbor, a neighboring slave was killed by one of your animals, if it was gored by an ox, you owed that person 30 shekels of silver for the slave that had died. Now think about this. Think about the two people in the story. How much was Jesus worth to Mary? He was worth every extravagance she could possibly come up with. How much was Jesus worth to Judas? About as much as a dead slave. It's interesting to think about this scenario because if you walked into that room at that moment, as an outsider, you would assume that Mary was the sinful one here. That she was the sinful woman letting her hair down, giving some kind of extravagant gift inappropriately to a man. And you would probably assume that Judas was the upright godly man trying to live by God's law, certainly by the things that he says. But sometimes things are not as they appear. And we know that God judges the heart. 
not outward appearance. Because on the surface, Mary was the godless one and Judas the godly. But in reality, it was Judas who was in bed with the devil. And this is a word of warning for all of us. Not to judge by outward impressions. Because there's a lot of people projecting a godly facade, but on the inside have the attitude of Jesus or Judas. Looking out for themselves, only interested in what they can get out of God, not in God himself. And here's, that's really, I think, the key difference between Mary and Judas. And I believe this is really a key difference between an empty religious person and a true disciple of Jesus. Mary asked, listen to the difference. Mary asked, how much can I give to my Savior? And Judas asked, how much can I get out of Jesus? You hear the difference? Do you adore God himself or do you just adore what you think you might get out of God? There's a big difference. How much is Jesus worth to you? You know, when Jesus becomes your one thing, when being in his presence is the focus of your life, here is the only response that makes sense. There's only one appropriate response when you're in the presence of Jesus. Sacrificial worship. Sacrificial worship. You cannot truly spend time in the presence of the King of Kings and not be compelled to extravagant worship. When you really know Jesus, you don't know about him, but you know him. Just like Mary knew him, then you offer him everything that you have. I want you uh, to, to think with me um, about something that comes up at the end of this passage. I heard another pastor talk about this one time, and I was just fascinated by the thought. And, and some of this, as we think about the end of Jesus' life, some of this is, uh, is a conjecture. We're just piecing together some of the pieces of the end of his life. But I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Look again at what it says in, in verse 7. Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Now, I want you to think about this with me. It's interesting because when you think about the story, eventually we get, just fast forward a little bit, we get to the empty tomb. And the women go there to anoint Jesus and prepare his body for permanent burial after he died, right? But what happens? They don't get a chance to anoint him, do they? They don't get a chance to put the perfume upon his body. Why? Because he's already gone. So in fact, I think it was in this moment, as Jesus has said, when he is anointed properly for his death. Now remember, this perfume was intensely pure. Again, like I said earlier, probably meant to be watered down, only used a couple of drops at a time. This is very strong stuff. Now imagine even taking a, a, a bottle of current day perfume, even which would be less strong, but taking that perfume and pouring it over your head or uh, down your body onto your feet. If, if you're a man like Jesus, allowing that to seep into your beard, to, to, to sit and sort of seep into your skin, not washing it away, but allowing it just to be there. And imagine if you were in a culture that is not like ours, where you did not bathe every day. In fact, you bathe far less frequently than that. A few days later, what do you imagine you would smell when you inhaled? You'd smell that perfume, wouldn't you? Now think about how this story unfolds. The very next thing in John's gospel in chapter 12 is the, is the story we call the triumphal entry. It's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday when, when crowds welcome Jesus into Jerusalem and they're shouting, Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, you're the king, right? 
What is that? That's the beginning of Passion Week. That means that when this event occurs, we are actually only a few days away from the moment when Jesus will be betrayed by Judas in the dark of night, betrayed with a kiss, arrested, trumped up on charges, beaten mercilessly, and eventually crucified. Is it possible that the last place that we find Mary is at Jesus' feet one last time at the cross? It tells us in Mark chapter 15 that there was a large crowd of women who had been his followers who were there as he died. What's the chances that Mary's in that mix? This one who loves him for, who has seen her own brother raised from the dead. This one who sits at his feet and soaks up his every word. This one who pours out the family heirloom in extravagant worship. What's the chances she's there? I think she's there. In a Roman crucifixion, they would uh, nail your arms to a crossbeam, but they would also nail your feet to the cross. Why? Because in a crucifixion, you die by suffocation. Your lungs collapse upon themselves, the weight of it. You, you die by asphyxiation. And so they would nail your feet to the cross because they want this to be torture. They want it to be slow. And by having your feet nailed to the cross, it would give you just enough leverage that you could push yourself up. Meanwhile, you, you know, your flesh being ripped apart by the spike that held them. But you could push yourself up just enough to get a little bit of breath into your lungs. Eventually, we know that if it's stretched on too long, sometimes a day or more, and they just got tired of, of waiting, they would break your legs. Why? So that you couldn't push yourself up to take in that breath any longer. We know from the scriptures that there was a prophecy about Jesus not having his bones broken and they say that he, he gave up his spirit before that ever occurred. So I imagine Mary there at Jesus' feet one last time. And as Jesus hangs there with the weight of the sin of the world upon his back. As he presses himself up to take those last few inhales of breath, could it be that in those final breaths, the smell that enters his nostrils is that act of extravagant worship that Mary poured on his feet just a few days before. That as Jesus was there offering all that he had, he was reminded of someone else who attempted to offer all that she had to worship. Why do we offer Jesus everything? Because he first offered us literally everything. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, But thanks be to God, 
who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. In John 12, we're told that Mary's gift filled the house with the fragrance of perfume. Here we're told by Paul that as children of God, we will fill this world with the fragrance of the aroma of Christ as we offer ourselves back to him broken vessels poured out that the world may know the one true God. How much is Jesus worth to you? Where's the limit that you have set? You say, I'll, I'll give this to you, Jesus, but not, not that. That's too much. Jesus deserves our everything. Last week I asked you this question, how will you posture your life this year to spend more time sitting at his feet? And today what I want to tell you is that if you spend more time with him, here's the one thing I guarantee you, you will do this year. You will worship. Because the only natural response for those who sit at Jesus' feet, those who spend time with him, when you really know him, when you really know what he's done, the only response that makes any kind of sense is to worship, to offer him everything. The disciples said, Mary, this is wasteful. And I think the scriptures say to us, no, you go waste your life on Jesus. Let's pray. Oh God, we want to be an offering to you, broken and poured out, that it might be a fragrance of worship pleasing to you. You offered us everything first. And now, God, by your Spirit, give us the, the strength to offer you everything in return. We adore you, Jesus. We lay it all at your feet, King of kings, Lord of lords. You're everything to us. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.